So Donald Trump gives a full and unconditional pardon to Michael Flynn, which Michael Flynn accepts. And what does Judge Emmett Sullivan do? He writes a 42 plus page judgment about it. Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber, and I think it was a couple of weeks ago now, Donald Trump pardoned Michael Flynn. Michael Flynn accepted the pardon, thus ending that entire judicial saga, or so I thought. What did Judge Emmett Sullivan just do? He wrote a 42-plus page judgment dismissing the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss as moot. 42 plus pages of judgment. Just stop for a moment and appreciate the labor that had to have gone into a 42 page judgment, the cost of that judgment and the utility of that judgment, given the fact that Michael Flynn was pardoned and that really ended the entire judicial saga. But like I say, the true bullies are the ones who take a punch at someone who they know cannot punch back and Judge Emmett Sullivan in that 42 page judgment did nothing but take punches at Flynn, knowing that Michael Flynn could not punch back. Now I know what some of you might rightly be saying that judges always get the final say there are always the ones taking the final punch and the individual about whom they are rendering the judgment is no longer capable of punching back. That is not always true because at the very least in normal circumstances you could appeal the decision. But Judge Emmett Sullivan is rendering this well-drafted 42 and a half page judgment knowing that it will never go to appeal, no one can ever respond to it, and he gets the last say on Michael Flynn. And you know what? It's early already in the- It's early in the stream, but I am already worked up and I am already hot. Ow! I think I might have just broken a window of my office. United States District Court for the District of Columbia, United States of America versus Michael T. Flynn, defendant. Memorandum Opinion. Pending before the court are, one, the government's motion to dismiss the criminal information against Mr. Flynn with prejudice pursuant to federal rule of criminal procedure 48A, and two, the government's notice of executive grant of clemency and consent motion to dismiss this case as moot. More simply put, what you have in front of the court is that motion to dismiss that was filed by the Department of Justice that never got adjudicated upon because it went to the Court of Appeal, then it went to a full panel of the Court of Appeal, then it went back to Judge Sullivan, who seemed to take his time adjudicating on that motion to dismiss. And you have the notice of the executive grant of clemency, which really puts an end to everything. But not wanting this to go out with a notice, but rather a 42 and a half page judgment, Judge Emmett Sullivan feels compelled to draft this judgment. Upon careful consideration of the motions, the applicable law, the entire record herein, and for the reasons explained below, the court denies as moot the government's motion to dismiss pursuant to Rule 48A and grants the government's consent motion based on the presidential pardon and dismisses this case as moot. Judge Emmett Sullivan just had to find some way to deny the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss, even if he only denied it on a technicality in that it became moot because of the pardon, but he had to find a way to deny the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss, and he did. But at least, if only in the mind of Judge Emmett Sullivan to quote the great Stewie Griffin. Victory is mine! Oh! And now let's see how he fills 42 pages of judgment. It starts off with an amazingly self-serving and one-sided summary of the FBI investigation. We're not going to go into it because we've gone into it at length in prior vlogs just to read the first paragraph. The criminal conduct underlying the offense as set forth in the information was admitted to by Mr. Flynn when he entered his guilty pleas in this case. The information which was filed on November 30, 2017 charged Mr. Flynn with one count of willfully and knowingly making materially false statements to the Federal Bureau of Investigation FBI in violation of 18 U.S.C. Section 1001A2 during his interview with two FBI agents on January 24, 2017 in the White House. By the way, just count how many times Judge Emmett Sullivan is going to bring up the fact that Michael Flynn pleaded guilty twice, allegedly pleaded guilty twice, ignoring the fact that there is an argument as to whether or not his first guilty plea in front of Judge Contreras was invalid because of Judge Contreras' conflict of interests. But like a true bully who knows he's getting the last order, no one can talk back, he is going to keep bringing that up over and over again in the context of this 40 two page judgment. As the investigation continued, Mr. Flynn made a series of materially false statements to the FBI investigators during an interview at the White House on January 24, 2017 about his conversations with the Russian ambassador. Judge Emmett Sullivan is taking advantage of this monologue to which there can be no response to ignore the fact that even according to the FBI and the DOJ, those statements were not necessarily false, but rather were qualified as being equivocal. Equivocal as in, I'm not sure, I can't quite remember, but according to Judge Emmett Sullivan, Michael Flynn has to have a darn good memory because of his position in the government. Moving on to the more juicy elements of this judgment. Separately, Mr. Flynn also admitted to making false statements in the documents that he submitted to the United States Department of Justice on March 7, 2017, under the Foreign Agents Registration Act, stating that, quote, Mr. Flynn stipulated and agreed that he violated FARA by making materially false statements, end quote, in the FARA filings. Those FARA filings concerned a project that Mr. Flynn and his company, Flynn Intel Group, Inc., performed on behalf of the Republic of Turkey. Mr. Flynn, however, was not charged with any FARA violations. And then this is 
is where it gets really good to be drafting a monologue that no one gets to respond to because while silence may not be violence, sometimes silence is nonetheless very damning. On November 30, 2017, Mr. Flynn entered into a plea agreement with the government upon the advice of counsel. Judge Rudolph Contreras accepted Mr. Flynn's guilty plea on December 1, 2017, finding that Mr. Flynn entered the plea knowingly, voluntarily, and intelligently with the advice of counsel. On December 7, 2017, this case was randomly reassigned to this court. <laughs> Hmm. What Judge Emmett Sullivan does not mention here is that the counsel advising Michael Flynn to plead guilty were the same counsel that had prepared his FARA filings for him. I don't think I'm going on much of an ethical limb here when I say that that counsel might have been in something of a conflict of interest in that they were the ones who prepared those FARA filings for Michael Flynn and they are now telling him to plead guilty. Maybe, just maybe, they have an interest in hiding their own professional misconduct. Judge Emmett Sullivan in his 42-page written soliloquy conveniently omits to mention this fact. He also conveniently omits omits to mention the fact that the reason why this file was randomly reassigned to him was because Judge Contreras had to recuse himself for conflict of interest because he was involved in a text exchange with Peter Stroke, the disgraced FBI agent whose conduct was impugned in this very file. It is a lesson parents oftentimes have to teach their kids, but a lie by omission is nonetheless a lie and it is oftentimes the most insidious kind of lie. On May 7, 2020, the government filed a motion to dismiss the criminal information against Mr. Flynn with prejudice pursuant to Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 48A. On the same day, and with the consent of the government, Mr. Flynn filed a motion to withdraw all of his pending motions without prejudice. The judgment then goes on to discuss the saga within the saga of the mandamus, which was originally granted, then vacated, and the entire file returned to Judge Sullivan to adjudicate on the motion to dismiss under the Rule 48A. Resumption of hearing on the government's motion to dismiss. Following the D.C. Circuit's denial of Mr. Flynn's mandamus petition and pursuant to this court's September 1, 2020 minute order, the parties filed a joint status report proposing deadlines for further briefing on the government's government's Rule 48A motion, as well as proposed dates for a hearing on the motion. Yada, 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 more procedural stuff. We know what happened during that five and a half hour hearing, what happened subsequent to it. Let's just skip right to the pardon. On November 25, 2020, President Trump granted Mr. Flynn a, quote, full and unconditional pardon, end quote, for, one, quote, the charge of making false statements to federal investigators, end quote, in violation of 18 U.S.C. section 1001, as charged in the information in this case. Two, quote, any and all possible offenses arising from the facts set forth in the information and statement of offense, end quote, filed in this case, quote, or that might arise or be charged, claimed or asserted in connection with the proceedings, end quote, in this case. Three, quote, any and all possible offenses within the investigatory authority or jurisdiction of the special counsel appointed on May 17, 2017, including the initial appointment order number 3915-2017 and subsequent memoranda regarding the special counsel's investigatory authority, end quote, and... <sighs> Quote, any and all possible offenses arising out of the facts and circumstances known to, identified by, or in any manner related to the investigation of the special counsel, including but not limited to, any grand jury proceedings, end quote, in this district or in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia. Now, love it or hate it, but that is one pretty broadly drafted pardon. And Michael Flynn accepted the pardon. The Department of Justice moved to dismiss the case as moot, but Judge Emmett Sullivan had some things to say about it. Judge Emmett Sullivan basically exploits of the opportunity to basically say that everything he did in the context of this file to analyze and dissect the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss under the Federal Rules of Procedure 48A was totally justified. In fact, as we will see later on in this judgment, I am now thoroughly convinced that Judge Emmett Sullivan would have actually dismissed the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss, and we're going to see why. Rule 48A provides that the, quote, government may, with leave of the court, dismiss an indictment, information, or complaint, end quote. Based on its terms, the, quote, leave of court requirement, quote, obviously vests some discretion in the court, end quote. We have discussed this in previous vlogs with leave of the court does in fact mean with permission of the court and although the court is not supposed to be a rubber stamp in granting Department of Justice's motion to dismiss as was argued before Judge Sullivan they're supposed to be sort of rubber stamp ish rubber stamp ish because while the leave of the court is required to dismiss a case under rule 48a given the separation of the powers between the executive the judicial and the legislative branches it is not up to the courts to be prosecutors in a case and when the prosecutor decides they don't want to prosecute it's not up to the courts to continue that prosecution but in arguing from a conclusion as opposed to towards one, Judge Emmett Sullivan reasons as follows. Furthermore, the court's authority to consider the unopposed Rule 48A motion here is not contrary to the Supreme Court's decision in Rinaldi. In Rinaldi, the court reviewed an agreement between the defendant and government to dismiss an indictment based on the government's violation of a federal policy precluding multiple prosecutions for the same act. 
It is always nice for a judge to unilaterally declare that the Supreme Court agrees with him, but now let's just get into the judge's reasoning in his consideration of the Rule 48A dismissal. While courts have a role in considering Rule 48A motions, they are limited to narrow circumstances in which they may exercise their discretion in denying leave to dismiss. See Fokker. Fokker, out. After all, quote, discretions to dismiss pending criminal charges lie squarely within the ken of prosecutorial discretion, end quote, end quote, at the core of the executive's duty to see the faithful execution of the laws, end quote. But in this case, opining on a question that has now become totally moot, the judge says it was a close call in this case. Whether to deny leave in this case is a close question, but is mooted by Mr. Flynn's acceptance of the president's pardon. As an initial matter, the court does not find that the government's submission is a mere conclusory statement of the reasons for dismissal, and so denial of leave would not be warranted on this ground. However, while not conclusory, many of the government's reasons for why it has decided to reverse course and seek dismissal in this case appear pretextual, particularly in view of the surrounding circumstances. For example, Mr. Flynn was serving as an advisor to President Trump's transition team during the events that gave rise to the conviction here, and as this case has progressed, President Trump has not hidden the extent to his interest in this case. According to Mr. Gleason. Mr. Gleason being the overtly partisan amici that was appointed by Judge Emmett Sullivan himself to continue the prosecution when the prosecution themselves did not want to continue this case. Yeah, let's see what he had to say. According to Mr. Gleason, between March 2017 and June 2020, President Trump tweeted or retweeted about Mr. Flynn, quote, at least 100 times, end quote. A hundred tweets over the course of three years in the context of the prosecution of his former national security advisor, and I'm supposed to find something fishy or suspect in that? While I may think that Trump has at at times engaged in odd behavior on Twitter, this is not the example of it. This commentary has, quote, made clear that the president has been closely following the proceedings, is personally invested in ensuring that Mr. Flynn's prosecution ends, and has deep animosity toward those who investigated and prosecuted Mr. Flynn, end quote. Oni soit qui mal y pense, there is an awful lot of projection going on in that statement. Given this context, the new legal positions the government took in its Rule 48 a motion and at the motion hearing raised questions regarding its motives in moving to dismiss. It is always a risky venture and, in my humble opinion, an indication of thoroughly flawed reasoning to go investigating motives and not facts. And as we will see further on in this judgment, all that is left for Judge Sullivan to do is attack the motives and not the facts. Furthermore, Rule 48A's, quote, leave of court standard requires the court to consider the objective reasonableness of the government's justification for seeking dismissal. Whereas here the government justifies its motion by ignoring applicable law to now question the strength of its case, substantial doubt arises about the government's stated reasoning reasons for seeking dismissal. The government's second rationale is that it, quote, does not believe it could prove that Mr. Flynn knowingly and willfully made a false statement beyond a reasonable doubt, end quote. To support this rationale, the government initially pointed to the fact, which was known at the time Mr. Flynn pled guilty, that the FBI agents who interviewed him did not think he was lying, and it also noted the, quote, equivocal or, quote, indirect nature of Mr. Flynn's responses. Equivocal answers to questions do, in fact, make it very hard to accuse someone of lying. You can accuse them of being evasive, but it is difficult to accuse someone of lying when they provide an equivocal answer, as in, I'm not sure I recall. So that does seem like a pretty good reason on its face to dismiss the charges if the answers that were provided were equivocal and not outright demonstrable lies. But even though the question has now become totally moot, Judge Emmett Sullivan has some questions. As an initial matter, whether or not the FBI agents thought Mr. Flynn was lying is irrelevant in a false statements case. And the government has not explained how evidence that the government previously stated was, quote, consistent and clear, end quote, suddenly became equivocal or indirect. With regard to Mr. Flynn, Flynn's alleged, quote, faulty memory. Mr. Flynn is not just anyone. He was the national security advisor to the president, clearly in a position of trust, who claimed that he forgot within less than a month that he personally asked for a favor from the Russian ambassador that undermined the policy of the sitting president prior to the president-elect taking office. You know what the biggest problem with this monologue is, other than the fact that Judge Sullivan basically just confirmed that Michael Flynn answered questions to the effect that he could not remember, is that this is not a confirmed fact, this is a disputed fact, what Judge Emmett Sullivan just said. And just wait for this because Judge Emmett Sullivan has saved the best for last. With regard to the government's concerns about the assistant director for counterintelligence contemplating the goal of the interview, an objective interpretation of the notes in their entirety does not call into question the legitimacy of the interview. <coughs> for those of you who may not recall exactly what's going on right here, that was when the FBI was asking internally, what is the purpose of investigating Michael Flynn? Is it to get him to lie so they can prosecute him or get him fired? That's irrelevant. An objective reading of the notes determines that that is irrelevant. With objectivity like that, who needs biased judges? After framing the entire case in what 
what can only be described as the most self-serving of manners, which I guess is the judge's prerogative. The judge concludes that it was a close call, but I don't get to adjudicate on it because of President Trump's pardon. Asserting factual bases that are irrelevant to the legal standard, failing to explain the government's disavowal of evidence in the record in this case, citing evidence that lacks probative value, failing to take into account the nature of Mr. Flynn's position and his responsibilities, and failing to address powerful evidence available to the government likely do not meet this standard. Thus, the application of Rule 48A to the facts of this case presents a close question. However, in view of the President's decision to pardon Mr. Flynn and Mr. Flynn's acceptance of the pardon, and for the reasons stated in the following section, the appropriate resolution is to deny as moot the government's motion to dismiss pursuant to Rule 48A. Judge Emmett Sullivan has taken 38 pages to pat himself on the back for a job well done, but all of this has become moot given the pardon, and then Judge Emmett Sullivan goes on to pontificate on the pardon itself. The pardon power, however, is not without limitation. For example, a presidential pardon generally must be accepted to be effective. That I think we can all agree is true, but to me it reads like Judge Emmett Sullivan is actually setting up the situation whereby the courts might think that they can deny a pardon that was granted by the president. Call me paranoid, but that is the impression I get, although as they say, just because you're paranoid does not mean people are not out to get you. Sullivan then goes on to remind the readers that a pardon does not render the accused innocent. In fact, the accused will always have a taint of guilt to him in that he has to accept the pardon, which is something of an admission of guilt. And my goodness, does Judge Emmett Sullivan ever love that because now Michael Flynn will always have the aura of guilt and Judge Emmett Sullivan will have gotten what he wanted, which was a political resolution of the dispute as opposed to a judicial exoneration. As Chief Justice Marshall wrote, quote, a pardon is an act of grace proceeding from the power entrusted with the execution of the laws, which exempts the individual on whom it is bestowed from the punishment the law inflicts for a crime he has committed, end quote. Emphasis added. In other words, quote, a pardon does not blot out guilt or expunge a judgment of conviction, end quote. Furthermore, a pardon cannot, quote, erase a judgment of conviction or its underlying legal and factual findings, end quote. We get it, Sullivan. We get it. Flynn is guilty. He will never be exonerated from the court. Mission accomplished, it would seem. The history of the Constitution, its structure, and the Supreme Court's interpretation of the pardon pardon power make clear that President Trump's decision to pardon Mr. Flynn is a political decision, not a legal one. And this is exactly what I said in my last video where I responded to the pardon. This is a political resolution to the dispute, not a judicial one. And my goodness, it's going to make Judge Emmett Sullivan sleep like a baby at night. Accordingly, in view of the Supreme Court's expansive view of the presidential pardon power, the court grants the consent motion to dismiss this case as moot. Conclusion, for the reasons stated above, the court denies as moot the government's motion to dismiss pursuant to Rule 48A and grants the government's consent motion based on the presidential pardon and dismisses this case as moot. An appropriate order accompanies this memorandum opinion. So ordered Emmett G. Sullivan, United States District Judge, December 8, 2020. And Judge Emmett Sullivan's Christmas wish came early this year because he finally got to deny Deny the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss, if only on a technicality, but at the very least on paper, he got to deny the Department of Justice's motion to dismiss under Rule 48A. To the pettiest of tyrants go the pettiest of victories, and I like the sound of that, even if it doesn't actually make any sense, I just made it up right now, so I'm gonna write that down. All right, and that formally ends the Michael Flynn judicial saga, at least for now. And if you like my videos and you like my content, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, drop a comment in the comment section below because it feeds the algorithm. Be Missy Mouse. If you want to support the channel, all of the support links are in the pinned comment. We've got PayPal, Patreon, subscribe, star, YouTube membership. Robert Barnes and I have a page on Locals. It is called VivaBarnesLaw.Locals.com. I am also on Rumble, so if you're watching this on Rumble, congratulations, you found me. They found me. I don't know how, but they found me. But more important than any of that, take care of yourselves, check in on friends and family, especially during what is going to be an especially difficult holiday season, and at the very least now, you know your vlog. Peace out. Booyah. <laughs>